We are in Genesis 16 and 17. We're beginning with chapter 16. Um, and as I was preparing for this message this week, um, I don't know if th- those of you that have Facebook, you know that there's like a, a memories thing that pops up and it has all the, the memories from the past years. Well, this week I had the memory pop up of this trip that I went with Caitlin's family and some friends. Uh, we went to Sylvania. And we, we, what we did, we flew there, and when we drove e-bikes throughout the entire country, and we stopped at various cities along the way and, um, and stayed at hotels or stayed at just interesting places. And I remember as I was preparing for this, it reminded me of the first day. Me, so we rode bikes all day long, and at the end of the day, there was this, um, this grotto or something like this beautiful thing that we wanted to go see. So while all the, the grown-ups or the adults went back to the hotel where we were staying, me and a, a select few decided to go and take an adventure, take a detour, if you will, to go see this thing. So we drove an hour out of our way to go check out this, this awesome grotto or, or this water feature thing that we were wanting to see, and only to get there, and we had to get off our bikes and then hike another three hours. So we, remember, we just biked the entire day, pretty much all day biking, and then we biked an extra hour to get to this place, and then we had to get off these bikes and then a hike. So needless to say, we didn't want to do that. Well, one thing, I didn't want to leave a rented bike just somewhere random while I'm hiking for three hours, because what if it got stolen? And two, I was tired, and so was everybody else. So we decided not to do it. But we did stop for a drink that was at a shop there. Mind you, we didn't have the money that they needed because they didn't take cards, and luckily they took U.S. Um, but after we got, had our drinks, we decided, all right, let's go back to the hotel. And we went back, to, on our way back to the hotel, we somehow got lost, and we went an hour uh, in the wrong direction. So not, so not only does it take an hour to get back, we went an hour in the wrong direction. So it took us about two hours, maybe even longer, to finally get back to the hotel. And we got back to the hotel. We, we, we met up with the, with the rest of the group, and we agreed to tell them that, oh, man, y'all missed it. This was such an epic thing. Y'all should have seen it. We, so we did. We told them that until we finally did tell the truth and told them that the detour was, in fact, a bust. And the reason why I told that story, and I was reminded of that story, because in chapter 16, that's what we see Abram and Sarai doing. They take a detour when it comes to the will of God. And once again, this man of faith, this uh, father of those who believe, as the Bible calls him, displays a shallow kind of faith than than what we would expect to see. And he takes this detour, or the long way around, and it actually costs him a lot. And we're actually still experiencing the fallout of this decision even today. And we'll talk more about why about that later. But sometimes when we just trust the Lord, it can feel very scary because of this unknown factor that we have in our lives. It feels unsafe. And rather than living by faith, we live by sight. We live by what we can see. But the safest way to navigate through our lives is, in fact, living by faith, trusting in the Lord rather than only what we see in front of us. And we see that Abram and Sarai, they see what's in front of them. They see that they're they're super old and they're at the age where they shouldn't be able to have kids. So then they decide to do something to kind of force God's will to happen here. So let's, let's dive in. This is Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, was born him no children. And remember, we found out in earlier chapters that she was, in fact, barren. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain a child by her. And Abram heeded to the voice or the voice of Sarai. So Hagar, if you remember, she came from Egypt. If you remember, Abram went to Egypt during the famine years. This was another lapse of faith of Abram, that he went down there to escape the famine instead of going where God called him to go. And while there, they picked up this Hagar lady and became a a maidservant of Sarai. And what we see Sarai doing here is encouraging Abram to take part in what is essentially a surrogate Uh, birth or surrogate mother arrangement in those days. And according to the custom, a child would be considered a child of Abram and Sarai, not Abram and Hagar. 
And what we see is that the last verse here is that Abram heeded to the voice of Sarai. Now, this was a mistake. It's not always a mistake to listen to your wife, and sometimes it's the best thing a man can do, honestly. But in this case, it was, in fact, a mistake. They're unable to bear children, as we already know. And Sarah did something that goes against the nature of wives. I, you know, I don't know many wives that are going to say, all right, just sleep with this woman over here, right? She, she tells him to sleep with a Hagar. And why? Why does she do that? It's because she probably remembers what God promised. And the Bible, the Bible says that God's, uh, God's going to give them descendants, right? And another thing that we often hear growing up, and I know I, know I certainly heard it, was the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. The Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. You know, and I, and I, I got to admit, I thought this was in the Bible as well, but then if you go looking for this verse, it's actually nowhere to be found in the Bible. Paul doesn't say it. Peter doesn't say it. Jesus doesn't say it. The prophets don't declare it. Maybe it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 or something, but it's certainly not in the real Bible, in any books of the Bible that we have in Scripture. It's one of those phantom verses made up by man. And I actually did some research and found out it was actually Ben Franklin who said that. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't, in, it wasn't God at all. But a verse that really is in the Bible is Proverbs 13, 12. And it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I believe this is what's going on with Sarai at this moment. Because you just have to imagine, you have put yourself in their shoes. It's been 11 years since this promise came where God said that you were going to have uh, descendants. 11 long years. And just like we talked about last week, it's hard to wait on the Lord sometimes. You know, I imagine like I've been waiting a week or maybe you've been waiting a month for something to happen. They waited 11 years up to this point. And oftentimes when we're waiting and waiting and waiting, it's hard because the flesh gets really nasty. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And we have this tendency when we wait on the Lord and we're waiting and we're waiting and he's not doing what we think we should do, that we try to push it a little bit. We try to make it happen, so to speak. And we impose our own schemes and our own designs and produce something of the flesh rather than something of the spirit. And I believe that's what Sarai is doing here and what Abram does by following it as well. They've been waiting this 11 years and where first God, God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And year after year after year, Sarai is not getting pregnant. So here's a case of people trying to do it themselves. Where Sarah say, all right, we're not getting pregnant. I'm seeing this. Maybe I'm the issue. Here's my maidservant, Hagar. So that's what's going on. And even though this was accepted uh, in that culture of a surrogate motherhood, it certainly shows that they weren't, weren't trusting and being led by God at all. Let's see what happens in verse 3 through 4. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And after Abram dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So it's been more than 10 years since the promise was made regarding Abram's descendants. And by most accounts, like I said, 10 years is a long time. You know, I don't even like waiting a month or a week. They're, they're waiting a long time for this promise. And when you're waiting a long time, discouragement often can come into our lives. And it can make us vulnerable of acting out in the flesh. And yet, even after this, it's actually another 13 years until the promise actually does come where the promised child comes from Abram and Sarah, which would be Isaac. It'd be 13 years after this. So, what's the, what's, what does this mean for us? How can we relate to this? And I think we can relate to this because when we impatiently try to fulfill God's promise in our own efforts, it accomplishes absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, it not only accomplishes nothing, but it also could prolong the promise until the promise is actually fulfilled. And 
We see this as examples in, in Scripture. You think of Jacob. He had to live in exile for 25 years because he thought he had to arrange the fulfillment of God's promise to get his father's blessing. You think of Moses, who had to lead sheep for 40 years in the desert after he tried to arrange the fulfillment of God's promise when he killed the Egyptian. See, it's better to receive God's help than try to help God in our own flesh, and our own wisdom, and our own unbelief. And like I mentioned before, Hagar came from Egypt. They got her when, when, she, when they went down to Egypt, when they didn't trust God during the famine to stay in Canaan. And you may already know this, but our past has a way to catching up with us, doesn't it? Oftentimes our past catches up to us in, in bad ways. And what we see is Hagar gets pregnant. And so now it's pretty obvious what the real problem is. Maybe up to this point, they didn't really understand that it was Sarai who had the problem. Maybe there, it was between the two of them, obviously. But now they know exactly where the problem lies. The problem lies in Sarai. That Abram can, it can impregnate a fertile woman. So the ramifications means in that culture that something was wrong with Sarai. Maybe she was cursed even. So she was the problem. And anger arises in her heart. Moreover, Hagar despises Sarah, her mistress, as it says, when, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And thinking about this whole situation, it reminds me of what Paul asked in Galatians 3. It says, having begun in the spirit, are you now trying to be made perfect in the flesh? I think that's what we see them doing. And I think we have a tendency to do that too. When, when we see God starting to do something in our life, when he starts something in our life, and you're now trying to bring it to completion by your flesh and your own power. I mean, how many times in your own situation have you felt that? Have you stepped into trying to help God fulfill his promise? And sometimes we even try to counsel God. Say, God, you should do it this way, as if he needed our counsel. Let me tell you right now, God doesn't need our counsel. You know, we might step into an agenda, and when we step into that agenda, we're simply trying to fulfill God's promise in our own flesh, in our own ways. But what does Proverbs 3 tell us? Proverbs 3 is a familiar verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And we see that Hagar, I mean, uh, Sarai and Abram aren't doing that. They are taking the wrong road. They're taking a, a detour, if you will. So let's see what happens. Verses uh, 5 and 6. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. He's, he's, she's blaming Abram here. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that, sh that she was conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. Now I think about this. Who, whose idea was this? It was her idea, right? And it reminds me, I think it was Victor Hugo who said, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And here is Abram. He's saying, okay, sweetheart, you know, whatever you say, you know, whatever, you, whatever you want. And it happens. Hagar gets pregnant, and now she's blaming him. So what does Abram say? He says, indeed, your maid is in your hands. Now, According to ancient custom, that Hagar was the property of Sarai. So this is why he's saying this. He's, he's saying that, uh, indeed, your maid is in your hand. And then he says, do to her as you please. Now, Abram seemed to make a bad situation worse when he decided to turn the situation over to Sarai and not take care of his child that he is the father to. So... What's the takeaway? What, what can we learn from this situation? Well, these terribly complicated and difficult situations often rise out of our sin. They try to take God's word and try to force it, the promise to happen. And all in all, it's much easier to live our life trusting in and being obedient unto the Lord. God wants to spare us from these difficulties. If Abram just trusted and said, no, Sarai, no, we're not going to do that because God said we're going to have a child. They wouldn't have had these difficulties. See, God wants to spare us of difficulties. 
And what happens to Hagar, this last verse? And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So what did she do? She ran. She ran away. So then we see God dealing with Hagar in verses 7 and 9. It says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. So what it looks like is she's trying to run away and go back to Egypt where she came from. And she's by this spring of water in the wilderness. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from? Or where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And by the way, this is the first mention in scripture that we see this, uh, this angel of the Lord, this term angel of the Lord. You hear it often in the Old Testament. And there's, there's some difference of opinion on who this angel of the Lord is. You know, some people say it's Gabriel, the same angel that appeared to, uh, to Mary and Joseph uh, in the surrounding the situation with Jesus' birth. And other people say that this is, in fact, Jesus himself uh, before, the, before his time being born in Bethlehem. But here's what I love about this story. This story is a story of failure. And yet in the midst we see grace and mercy of God. We see his character. I love that we see his character, this overriding, overruling, intervening hand of God being uh, merciful and just not letting things just happen as they happen. But he has a hand in it in every situation. See, God told Hagar to do something difficult. God was walking with her during this, and this thing that he, that he told her to do was go back to, to this terrible situation and submit to Sarai. Now, I don't know many counselors today that would counsel a woman to go back to that situation, but that's what we see God doing. See, God has a plan. He's going to walk with her. And then we see the angel of the Lord, uh, he, prom he gives promises to Hagar to kind of help encourage her here in verses 10 through 12. It says, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. So we see here this promise is God had great plans for Hagar's son, Ishmael that he would become this great nation. And indeed, we know that he would become the father of the Arabic peoples. And Ishmael means that God hears. So every time that, that Hagar would call out, Ishmael, she would remember that God heard her by that well, that God was with her and God heard her. She, God intervened, the Lord intervened in her life. But then in verse 12, he gives a little information about this Ishmael. He says, he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. Now, what does this mean? Well, if you know history and look at what we're going through today, it's been 4,000 years since this, this happened. And we're still experiencing the conflict between the Arab people and the Israel people. Between both Jews and Arabs are descendants from Abram by these two half-brothers, Ishmael and the son that is going to come later, Isaac. And if you've been watching the news, you see that this conflict that's happening in Israel right now, it goes on even today. This, they're still at war with each other. And this is where it begins right here. We're reading about it in Genesis, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. It begins right here. This entire conflict can be traced back to Abram's decision to make Hagar pregnant. But it also can be traced to going to Egypt to begin with when he didn't trust God when he was supposed to stay in Canaan as well. It all begins here. So what does this tell us? It tells us the effect of our sin, right? The effect of our sin may reach far beyond what we can ever imagine. I'm sure when this happened, he had never imagined that 4,000 years later that they would still be fighting each other. And this is why I love that beautiful verse of Scripture that Paul wrote in Romans 5. It says, where sin has abound, grace did much more abound. And this is what we see in, in Hagar and Ishmael. It's an overflow. And this is an example of God's grace to this woman and her son. 
And Ishmael's life would not be easy. It definitely would not be easy, but God would still bless and sustain him. And God's dealing with Hagar is an encouragement to us. It gives us hope. Why? Because we see God's hand in the mess. Hagar was just caught in the middle of this, right? She, she did what her maidservant did, got pregnant. She kind of got, she, she didn't do really much of anything other than obey her, maid, her, her, her uh, Sarai, right? But God sees her suffering and, and he's in the midst of that suffering. And that's an encouragement to us because he's in the midst of our sucker, suffering today. We can trust in God, even in our suffering. So let's keep going, verses 13 and 16. Then she said, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. And for she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Ber Lahai Roy. Observe, it's between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram named his son who Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now Hagar knew that this wasn't just a, a mere angel who appeared to her. She said the angel of the Lord was also the God who sees. It's the same one watching over Hagar and eventually Ish, Ishmael. And apparently Hagar did return, did what the angel of the Lord said, returned and submitted herself to Sarai. And they must, she must have told him the whole story because we see Abram, in fact, naming the son Ishmael like the angel of the Lord commanded uh, Hagar. So that's the end of chapter 16. And we end chapter 16 with, um, it's interesting, between 16 and 17, there's a gap in years. There's a 13-year gap. So when we begin chapter 17, Ishmael is a young teenager, and Abram is 99 years old, and Sarai is 90 years old, and they're raising this 13-year-old. And like we say in the South, bless her heart. Bless their heart. <laughs> That's amazing to me. So just know that there's a 13-year gap between these two chapters as we begin chapter 17. But in chapter 16, we see that, that Abram doesn't trust the Lord, but he trusts Sarai and tries to do things in his own power. So let's begin chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, so we see that gap here. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. I am almighty God. Undoubtedly, this is another appearance of, of God in the person of Jesus. And what, is, what does it say? He says, I am my almighty God. Now, almighty God means El Shaddai in the Hebrew. And there's many different uh, uh, people who believe this El Shaddai means certain things, but the Greek version of the Bible translates the Hebrew into Almighty, the one who has his hand on everything. So what does this Almighty God tell Abram to do? It says, walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. The word blameless literally means whole. So God wants all of Abram, wants a total commitment. Now, why does God tell him this? I believe God tells him this because of Abram's past, the things we've already talked about, right? You know, when Abram went to Haran for 15 years, he was supposed to go on to the, the land that he was promised, but he stopped in Haran. And when he stopped in Haran, he wasn't following after the Lord. He was following after his father and his family when they stayed there for 15 years. When they went down to Egypt during the famine, he wasn't walking before the Lord then either. He was walking before the 318 servants who needed food and water. And he thought, well, we need to, go to, uh, need to go to Egypt. And when he pulled the Hagar stunt in chapter 16, uh, he was with Sarah. He was walking before his wife. He wasn't walking with the Lord. So I believe that's why God said what he said here. Walk before me and be blameless. But here's what I think is cool. That Abram is 99 years old here, and God comes to him and says, you can still walk with me. And that is an encouragement to us, because you know, a new walk with God can happen at any time. It doesn't matter how, a, how old you are. It doesn't matter what you've gone through or what you've done. It doesn't matter. You can begin a new walk, a new relationship, an obedient walking relationship with God at any time. 
And God says, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So what is God doing? He's reminding Abram that he's not forgotten the covenant. Now, mind you, this, this gap between these years. So it's been 25 years since the promise was first made to Abram. And though it may seem that to Abram that God forgot, God didn't forget. He didn't forget the promise. And the last time we told that the Lord communicated with Abram was more than 13 years before this. So seemingly, Abram had 13 years of, of, of normal, if you will, fellowship with God, awaiting the promise all that time. And Abram has become this great, is becoming a great man of faith. But a great man of faith, it doesn't happen overnight. Right? It takes years of God working on Abram. And it takes years of God working on us, building our faith. Years of almost mundane trusting in the Lord, if you will. Mixed with some few spectacular encounters with the Lord. That's what we see in Abram's life. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you just had this mundane life, but then followed by like God did some, some miraculous things in your life. Building your faith along the way. That's what we see him doing in Abram. And that's what he does in our lives as well. Verses 3 through 8. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. So he's changing his name from Abram to Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make a nations of you. Kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation, and an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you, your descendants and your descendants after you, the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God." So to encourage Abram's faith here, what does he do? He changes his name from Abram to Abraham, from father of many to father of many nations. And there's many wonderful name changes in the Bible. The name of few, there's Jacob. He gets his name changed to, uh, to Israel. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to Genesis 32. But also in the New Testament, we know that Simon's name is, turned, is changed to Peter, the rock. And that's found in Mark. And God promises a wonderful new name to every overcomer in him in the book of Revelation. And God gives us many names in faith. As, for example, saint, righteous, chosen, royal priesthood, sons of God, and so on and so forth. And he knows he will accomplish the meaning of those names in us by his spirit. And to encourage Abram's faith in the... In the promise of land, God not only changed his name, but he repeated the promise again that he was going to give him this land, this everlasting possession given by an everlasting covenant. And if you look at the world today, today there's more than 13.3 million Jewish people on the earth. And there's 22 Arab nations with 300 plus million people. All of them trace their lineage back to Abram or Abraham. So this means that 5% of the earth's population can trace their genealogy back to Abraham. And now you know why God says, I am changing your name to the father of many nations. God fulfills that promise. He makes good on that promise if we look at the world today. And then he, he continues the conversation through 9 and 11. It says, And God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generation. This is my covenant which you uh, shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. And here it is. Here's the sign. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a sign, it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So circumcision, what I want us to understand, circumcision wasn't invented here. Um, it was actually something that was understood in that, in that culture and practiced in that culture uh, around the Middle East and where, where this was. But this is what I love. It, it, so th this is a, a social practice, and God 
transforms it into something. It's something that has meaning in that culture, but God is sort of redeeming it and letting it apply as a sign of the covenant. He turns it into something uh, with spiritual meaning. And what we've seen already and what we'll discover is when God makes a covenant, he provides some kind of sign, an outward indicator, one that we can see and it reminds, uh, reminds us of the agreement that God made with people. Um, we've already seen one of these signs in, in Genesis. We know when Noah and the ark, the sign of the covenant that he would never flood the earth again was that rainbow in the sky. There was a sign that whenever we saw it, it reminded us that God would never flood the earth again. We also have a sign later on, God made a, a covenant with Moses and the children of Israel. And what was that sign? The sign was the Sabbath. That was the day of rest. It was a peaceful and wonderful. And now what we're reading here is God gives a sign of the covenant that he gives with Abram. And that's a sign of circumcision. Circumcision is the sign. So then he gives instructions on how, how to do this circumcision, and starting with verse 12. He says, He who is eight days old among you, you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generation. Well, let's stop right there. I, I, I was wondering, it's like, why eight years old? I don't know if you, you think about these things. I'm just like, why in the world at eight? Why, why not five? Why not three? Well, I, I did some research, and it's interesting that science tells us that on the eighth day of, of childbirth, all the vitamins and nutrients and antibodies are present in the bloodstream that cause the clotting of blood. So if they're going to circumcise all these kids at eight days old, that's when the blood would be able to be clotted, and it won't just bleed and bleed and bleed. The clotting elements aren't there until the eighth day. It was the perfect day, and God knew that. So he said the eighth day. They shall be uh, circumcised. And it says, He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So the circumcision became a sign that everyone, every male had to have. And in verse 14, it says, And the uncircumcised male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of the, his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So those who reject this circumcision reject the sign of the covenant. They were no friend of the covenant that God made with Abram here. It wasn't that circumcision made them a part of the covenant, because faith did that. We already established that faith is what did that. But rejection of circumcision was a rejection of the covenant. And unfortunately, through the centuries, the Jews began to trust more in the sign of the covenant, the circumcision, than the God of the covenant. And they believed that circumcision by itself was the significant and necessary to be saved. And this is why in the New Testament that Paul refutes this idea. He refutes it extensively especially in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, says, For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Essentially, he's saying it doesn't matter. And then he says what does matter. He says, but faith working through love. That's what matters, our faith working through love. Therefore, through Christ, Christians can be, are free to circumcise or not circumcise. And I think the closest thing that Christians have uh, to circumcision, the closest parallel that we have, is baptism. And Paul actually relates the two in Galatians 2, 11 through 12. However, baptism is also a sign of the covenant. It doesn't save us. Baptism does not save us, but is a sign of the covenant that does. That, that sign of Jesus dying on the cross, that he was buried and he rose again. And that's exactly what the sign is. It's us when we're baptized. We're buried with Christ and we're rose again with Christ for forgiveness of sins. And being baptized doesn't save us. But I will say this. No Christian should refuse baptism because it is a sign. It's an outward sign to say, yes, I trust that I am buried with Christ and I'm rising again. 
So I'd be remiss to say, if you haven't been baptized, then what are you waiting for? Now's the time. If you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, it's time to be baptized. If you want to be baptized, then reach out to me or Caitlin or, or someone on the leadership, and uh, we would be happy to, to make that happen. We can, we can do, we have, we're surrounded by water. That'd be pretty easy to do. So just let us know, and we can make it happen. All right, let's keep going. Verses 15 and 16. And then God said to Abram, As far as for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of, kings of peoples shall be from her. So there's only a subtle difference between Sarai and Sarah. It's just an I and an H. But there, there, it's a, an important difference. Sarai would mean that she was a dominion to one family, where Sarah, with an H, is without restriction. She's the mother of many nations, of nations. And then God says, I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. See, God was trying to make it plain to Abram that this son would not come from another surrogate mother like Hagar and Ishmael, that it would come indeed by Sarah herself giving birth. Even though Sarah is 90 years old, well past the childbearing age uh, in a normal some person's mind frame and what we would think of as someone getting pregnant. She shouldn't have been able to get pregnant. But God is saying that it will. So then we see Abram's response. Then Abram fell on his face. And this is verse 17 and 18. Abram fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90, 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So Abram, Abram laughed. And I don't think this is a, a cynical laugh of doubt, but a rejoicing in something that he knew that was impossible that God was going to do. And by all outward appearance, it didn't seem possible, but God was going to accomplish this. Because he knew that both him and, and Sarai couldn't, they were too old. They shouldn't have been able to have kids. Yet Abram believed. And in Romans 4, 17 and 21, Paul actually writes about this, this wonderful description of Abram's faith in this promise. And this is what it says. This is Romans 4, 17 and 21. And the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall be your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he had also able to perform. But at the same time, we see Abram didn't really understand God's promise completely when he said, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Perhaps he th simply thought that God meant that Ishmael was going to be a spiritual son of, uh, uh, and Abram, like many of us, find it hard to trust God for more than what we can conceive, more than what we can see. And maybe he just thought it was Ishmael that was going to be the spiritual son. But then God makes it clear. He, we, don't, we don't see God rebuking Abraham here. He just says, he says this in 19 through 20. No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. So he's given him more details. He said, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. Now he's saying, you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him Isaac. He says, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you. Now get this. He actually, now, now Abram has a time frame on when this is going to happen. He says, at the set time next year. So he's 99 years old, and when he comes 100 years old, he's going to get Isaac. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abram, Abraham. So the, the name Isaac means laughter. And because he's going to be such a joy to his parents, but also always a reminder that Abram laughed, 
at God's promise to give him a son through Sarah at this old age. And Ishmael, we see, is also going to be blessed. Why? Because Abram prayed that he would. Abram prayed that God would bless him, and God heard that prayer, and he blesses him. But the covenant and its promise will be passed through the other son, this Isaac, that would come a year later, the son of promise. So now Abram, Abraham has a choice. So let's see what he does in verses 23 through 27. It says, So Abram took Ishmael his son and all who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's, Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that, that very same day as God had said to him. Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, and Ishmael was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And that same day, Abram was circumcised, and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with the money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So what we see is God leaves him after this revelation that he gives him, at least symbolically giving Abram an opportunity to make a decision. Now, it may be simple, maybe sound simple, but imagine Abram going up to a grown man and be like, hey, I got I to gotta circumcise you, man. I got to cut off the foreskin of, of, your, uh, of your, your stuff down here. No, that would not be easy. I would feel extremely uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I would feel extremely, I'm uncomfortable even talking about this right now, to be honest with you. But, you know, <laughs> but, but it would have been very uncomfortable to do that. But what does he do? He does it immediately. He doesn't hesitate and obeys God. That very same day, he went home and circumcised himself, Ishmael, and everyone in his camp, every male in his camp. So as we close our time together, I want us to compare chapter 16 and chapter 17. And I think we learn a valuable lesson. Chapter 16, Abraham is following after Sarah's plan and not God's. And when we go against God's plan, we can really complicate our lives. You maybe experienced that in your own life. We see that in their lives as well. Deciding to sleep with Hagar served to only, uh, only cause hardships to everyone involved that we're still feeling the ramifications of today. In chapter 17, Abram was immediately obedient to God. His obedience is further evidence that he's choosing to trust God and to take him at his word. And Abram believed in the covenant, and it was provided by his obedience to, the cov to this command to circumcise all the male, himself, Ishmael, and all the males in his camp. So what does this tell us? It tells us what we believe will show in our actions. See, first comes this belief in believing, or faith, believing God, and then our obedient actions is a result of that faith. And this is why James in chapter 2, verse 21, he talks about our good friend Abraham here. He says this, this is James chapter 2, verse 21. It says, when not Abraham, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was filled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, we won't see Isaac for another couple of chapters. Uh, it's going to happen a year from the time that we're reading about now. Not in Scripture, but in, in time. Anyway, um, but we can take something out of this because we have the similar choice to Abram in these two chapters. Right? We can take fleshly actions by trying to work things out and make things work in our own power and strength, and it can mess up our lives, or... We can do what he does in chapter 17. We can have faith that is accompanied by obedient actions and trusting in his word. Now, my prayer for us today is we follow after chapter 17. And as we have faith, it is followed by obedient actions in our lives.